the Piper Alpha oil rig platform, one of the largest rigs in the world. It was said to be one, if not the most successful oil rig in the entire world, being able to produce more oil barrels than any other platform. That is, until July 6, 1988, when Piper Alpha became the place where one of the worst offshore oil disasters happened. Located 120 miles northeast of Aberdeen, Scotland, Piper Alpha stood at 300 meters high and was approximately 14,000 tons, having the capacity to accommodate over 200 people at a time. Considering its size at the time, Piper Alpha had rooms designed for accommodation where its staff would live for weeks while working. The Piper Alpha rig was divided into four different sections and had fireproof walls. Natural gas was also processed and exported at Piper Alpha. As part of the gas processing equipment, there were two pumps known as Pump A and Pump B. On the morning of July 6, 1988, Pump A was stopped in order to undergo routine maintenance and its pressure safety valve was removed. However, after the engineers working on it could not finish the job in one shift, they decided to seal the pump manually with a disc cover. The on-duty engineer filled out a permit which stated that Pump A should not be switched on under any circumstances. However. The engineer didn't physically hand this permit to the manager, instead, he left the permit in the control center before leaving. At 9.45 p.m. that night, Pump B failed due to problems with the methanol system presented earlier that day. Methane clathrate, which is flammable ice, began to accumulate, causing blockage to the compression system pipework, which caused Pump B to fail. Having only 30 minutes before a total power shutdown, the manager decided to look through the documents he had at hand to analyze whether Pump A could be restarted. Unaware of the existence of the permit the engineer wrote earlier on that day and having not found any document himself, Pump A was restarted at 9.52 p.m. None of the people working at the event knew that the pressure safety valve on the machine had been removed. The missing valve went completely unnoticed since the metal disc replacing the safety valve was several yards above ground, making it out of sight. At 9.55, condensate pump A was switched on. Gas immediately went into the pump, which caused overpressure. The metal disc, which had only been manually capped, did not stand a chance against the high-pressure gas. The alarms began to sound, but unfortunately, before anyone had the chance to do anything about it, the escaped gas ignited causing a massive explosion. The control room was almost completely destroyed, and because of this, an evacuation did not immediately happen. Although the rig had fireproof walls, they were not blastproof, so the explosion managed to rip through the control rooms and blow through the firewalls, separating the different sections of the rig, including the workers' accommodation. Making things worse, automatic fire suppression systems were not active when the explosion happened, this is because the way they worked was collecting seawater, but it had been turned off so the divers could carry out maintenance earlier on that day. Having no way to fight the strong flames, they started taking over the platform, making it difficult for the workers to safely evacuate. Multiple areas of Piper Alpha were affected. Workers tried their best to leave the oil rig by any means necessary. Some lucky ones could climb to lifeboats, others, in desperation, jumped into the water trying to escape the fire. Unfortunately, escaping the oil rig did not mean safety, as a second explosion happened when an oil pipeline caught fire. 167 people lost their lives, but 61 workers fortunately escaped death. Listen to the story of a surviving worker who worked on the Alpha Piper and escaped death. When I was in my mid-twenties, I moved to one of the Orkney Islands in Scotland to work as an assistant maintenance engineer on one of the world's biggest oil rigs back then, the Piper Alpha. The construction was so massive that there were even enough space for us workers to live there for weeks. My job at Piper Alpha consisted of helping the multiple maintenance engineers do their jobs. The oil rig platform was very complex. There were four different sections called modules where the magic happened but the module where I used to spend the most time was Module C, the module where we took care of gas compression. The morning of the 6th of July, 1988, I was part of the day shift as usual. I worked in the gas conservation module area, but in the afternoon I was told to go to work in the gas compression room. The examination of the gas compression pumps was due and had to be carried out as soon as possible. During the overhaul, we needed to remove pump A's safety valve. Therefore, pump A was stopped 
As a replacement for the safety valve, the condensate pipe was temporarily sealed manually with a metal disc cover. We worked hard on it during that day, but then our shift ended. We still hadn't managed to finish our job. The engineer in charge then went to check that the metal disc was still alright, but before this, he told us we could go as our shift had ended. He mentioned he still had to go do the necessary paperwork to inform the next ship's manager about pump A's missing valve and strictly warn him not to restart that pump. I was so tired, I went straight to sleep. As soon as I hit the pillow, I fell asleep like a rock. But after a few hours, I woke up and couldn't go back to sleep again. As I was trying to relax, I heard a mighty blast, but before my brain even had time to process the sound, I was already flying off across the room and hitting a wall before landing on the floor like a sack of spuds. I was astounded. There was a ringing in my ears and my vision was blurry. My heart was pounding so hard that I felt like it was going to burst out of my chest, as if it was vibrating at an abnormal frequency from the blast. When my eyes finally could see clearly, I noticed the accommodation room was a mess and many people lay on the floor. Explosion! Explosion! Someone shouted as he stood by the door, gesturing for everybody to evacuate. People, including me, rushed to grab the ones who were unable to walk easily after the blast had left the room. While walking down the dormitory corridor, I noticed how boiling hot the corridor felt. It was as if we were inside of an oven. When I managed to get out into the open air, I realized just how bad everything was. People were shouting, crying, and rushing off to the lifeboats or to aid others who were badly burned. I felt a knot in my stomach. There were multiple people who looked in a very bad state, with burns so profound that their skin looked more like raw meat. It was so surreal. I forgot about the immediate danger and just wandered around, looking at the devastation. As I wandered, I saw a friend of mine who was supposed to be working the night shift at the control room. He was coming from one of the doors, limping and his arms held high. His arms were completely red. They had sustained drastic burns. I could not understand how he was still standing since he had the worst burns I had ever seen someone alive have. What happened? I asked him. We have to go, now, he shouted. But where are the others from the control room? If they're as hurt as you are, we need to put them on lifeboats too, I suggested. They're dead, he shouted as he held back tears. I know I should have seen it coming, but I still didn't expect to hear that people had actually died. I grabbed my friend and helped him go to one of the remaining lifeboats. I was offered to go too by Alistair, one of the oldest guys in our crew, but seeing other people who looked more roughed up than I did, I declined and told him to continue with the injured people. As my friend's lifeboat was being lowered down, screaming intensified. It's getting stronger! People shouted. Lots of people panicked and rushed over to the guardrails, throwing themselves into the sea. When I saw the first people doing this, I couldn't believe it. We were over 100 feet high. I rushed to the edge to see if they had made it. Surprisingly, some of them looked like they had. Looking down also made me realize that the fire was quickly working its way up, faster than I expected. Some of the people on the lifeboats and rafts being lifted down were screaming and covering their faces as much as they could as the blazing heat seemed to be blowing against them. I knew it was time to go. I desperately began searching for a lifeboat or a life raft, anything I could use to get out of there, but I noticed a whole bunch of people started to ditch the lifeboats and throw themselves into the sea. I even saw a couple of people with third degree burns, almost unable to walk, throwing themselves into the water without the slightest hesitation. I couldn't help but be bewildered at the people jumping off like it was nothing. Was it desperation? Was it bravery? I continued wandering confusedly when Alistair grabbed me by the shirt. He yelled at me for still being on the platform and stressed that we needed to jump immediately and swim as fast as we could. What about that lifeboat? I pointed out but he still told me lowering them was too slow, and the heat from the fire now covering the lower decks in the bottom section would possibly hurt us more than jumping out. I went with Alistair up to the edge. He could tell I was terrified, so he grabbed my hand. Slowly, he counted up to three and shouted at me to jump. I do not know how I managed to do so, but I ended up jumping with him. Jumping was the most frightening thing I have ever done. As soon as we jumped, Alistair's and my hands separated, my body felt light yet heavy at the same time, and although I knew I wasn't, I felt like I was falling so slowly. 
As I was falling, the extreme heat coming from the bottom part of the rig hurt my limbs, as if I held them over a candle for too long. When I least expected it, my body hit the water. I landed extremely hard, so hard my ankle really hurt after that. I swam to the top, and then I looked around at where Alistair was. He was already swimming far ahead of me. I followed him, trying to ignore my pain. I focused on swimming as fast as I could and tried not to look back. As I swam, I could hear strong sizzling noises, so loud that they overpowered the sound of the restless sea. At some point, I heard Alistair shouting at me. He had managed to go on a lifeboat. He was waving at me to swim there. I did as he said. After a minute or so, I managed to get there. Alistair and another dude grabbed me and pulled me in. When in the lifeboats, I finally noticed why I felt so much pain. I managed to burn my arms and also, to make things worse, my ankle's bone was completely the other way around. But this didn't seem to faze me as much as the view in front of me. The rig looked like the apocalypse. Not even the sea was safe, as there were oil spillages on it too, which were in flames. We were still near the platform, so people did what they could to make the lifeboat move quicker. A couple of minutes later, we noticed a rescue motorboat heading underneath the platform, as there were some people directly under, trying to swim away. When we saw the rescue boat, we began to cheer. Hope was restored, hoping that now we'd have help coming through. The boat picked up at least six people who were near the fire. Among them, I noticed my best friend Calum. I was so happy to see another familiar face safe. Unfortunately, the joy didn't last longer. Only seconds after seeing them wave at us after being rescued, we saw a bright orange ball of flame completely covering Piper Alpha, followed by the sound of a strong blast. A strong heat reached the lifeboat. The air was so hot that it blinded us, so we covered our faces and looked the other way. As soon as I could, I looked back. Almost all the sections of the platform were consumed by fire. Even the crane was now burning, and bits of the platform seemed to be starting to fall off. The rescue boat had been utterly destroyed in the blast, and parts of it that still stood were burning away. I stood up and tried to find Calum, but unfortunately, this was not the case. We could not see any of the people who were there only a few seconds ago. Fearing another explosion, we decided to keep going. When we finally got to a safe distance, I contemplated what once looked like an indestructible construction burning rapidly to its destruction. To this day, Piper Alpha is one of the costliest man-made catastrophes. It happened because that letter that was supposed to explain how Pump A should not be restarted under any circumstances never got to the hands of anyone, so the pump was restarted to avoid a total power out, which they thought would have been a catastrophic in an economic sense, but that doesn't compare to all the catastrophe that ended up happening. A tragedy took the lives of 167 people, more than half of the people who were working and living there when the explosion happened. 61 workers, including me, ended up injured. But at least, in my case, nothing compares to the survivor guilt I still feel whenever I think that if only that document had gotten into the hands of anyone on the next shift, none of this would have happened. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe if you dare.